possibly one of my favorite songs of all time and, and definitely one that feels very relevant is the first one which is uh, what's going on by marvin Gaye, and obviously the whole album's just such a seminal record just timeless when did you when did you first um hear it and uh you know what you know you I, I thought you were going to ask me sort of times and stuff and i'm not very good with that but really early on and and my sort of genre of music is very much that and my whole life has been based around music i design to music i dream to music everything and it has to have a certain beat if the, if the wrong music is on my mood can change so um i mean marvin gay i saw live at the Apollo in Victoria and almost nearly got chosen to get up on stage and dance with him. Wow. Uh, I, was, I was actually with Lulu, the singer, we were there and it was just incredible. I mean, every single song he's ever written is just magic to me. Um, his words, his tone. And I, it, I don't know anyone that if you put that music on doesn't love it, even if you're into rock and you know, a different genre of music. But I was very young when I heard that. And my brother paid, played a huge part in my music choices. Um, he was really into music, all kinds of music, but that particular kind of genre of music. Um, so I guess he probably gave it to me to listen to. And I've still got one of the original um, records. So I've, I've got a collection of some of my favorite albums. Uh, so I might even get some decks don't know we'll see <laughs> yeah you should i mean it's definitely a uh it's definitely an album that feels like you know if it got released ag again today as a new record it would kind of still sum up what's going on in the world at the moment and and mm -hmm. is there part of uh, listening to what's going on you know is it is it mainly just how beautiful the melody is and and how beautiful the song is um that that engaged you or, or were you sort of also drawn in by the by the kind of political and and um, you know cult. no never I'm, music to me is just how it sounds and how it makes you feel it's more the experience and yeah. as I said I'm very sensitive uh, to music and I've only just you know told the world recently that I actually if I hear music if I go and sit in a concert. I get lost and I can design an entire project by just listening to music. I can visualize it all. Um, when I was working with P. Diddy in LA, um, we were in the back of his car listening to D'Angelo and he went, that's what I want my bedroom to look like. And I looked at him and I went, I cannot believe you've just said that to me. No one has ever said that other actually than another uh, client of mine, Boy George. but it was so like such a revelation that somebody understood what I was doing. Um, and I totally got it. He also pointed to a pair of shoes and said, I want my bathroom to look like that. And I got that. And I, it might sound really bizarre to anyone that's going to listen to this, but oh. things and music and sound resonates in me and creates creativity. So I, I'm, I would be lying if I said I listened to the words. I might now actually. But, but then I think that's a different way of listening to music, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And even though he made the album, what's going on kind of against Barry Gordy's initial wishes, because he didn't want Motown to become political and stuff, um, it kind of stands up by itself completely as just uh, melodically and, and mm. the song and the way it was written the way it makes people feel just by listening to it without paying attention to the words or the themes. It kind of stands yeah. up separately as a political statement and then just as a, a melodic, um, you know, just beautiful melodic song. Um, so yeah, so it's always interesting to, to know which, which side of it um, drew people in more because a lot of people have mentioned what's going on. And just then you mentioned uh, D'Angelo, you've chosen Lady, which is, mm -hmm. is, is that from D'Angelo's first record? Um, I think it was. I mean, he hasn't done many, has he? Yeah, and actually, the, the latest one that, that he did, I believe, I, I didn't like as much as his original. I mean, that, that particular album was, there's just nothing about it that I, I don't love. And it just sort of transports you into such a, well, transports me into just such a good mood and such a, 
you know, music is about making you feel good, isn't it? It's about what resonates with you. And, you know, it's a really interesting thing about, you know, some people love to go and watch opera and listen to opera. Some people love classical music. I used to listen to a lot of classical music at a certain point in my, my life, you know, when I woke up in the morning, but it just doesn't, doesn't do the same thing. It's not that I don't love it, but with D'Angelo, if I put that album on, I'm good, you know, and in my design room, I have to choose the music and it has to be right or I can't design the best. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting to, to hear how kind of interlinked like music and, and, and design are for you. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, sounds, it sounds like, you know, you've designed for some in incredible clients, a lot of whom um, are musicians. And have you, have you ever found yourself designing for a musician who's kind of famous, but you d hadn't ever listened to their music? Has, it, has there ever been a case where it's like, oh, you know, I've heard of you, but I don't know your tunes? Uh, I won't say who they are. I've, I've designed for somebody very well known whose music I don't like at all. And it's not because it's, it's not, I, I don't say that because he is extraordinary but it does nothing for me. I understand how brilliant it is. There's probably one or two tracks and I've thought about it and it's always about the tone and the beat. That's really important to me. But no, I would never say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it might not go down so well, but yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, that, that's, that's really interesting. So, so um, and quite, quite similar type of era and, and genre to uh, D'Angelo is, is May's Joy and Pain. Um, what, how come you chose that? Well, again, that, that was really relevant at a sort of time in my life when, when I heard that. And I am, I'm a big dreamer. I, I visualize everything. Everything is visual for me. I'm very dyslexic. So if I hear a, a, um, a song that has been very important at a point in my life, it will take me straight back. It will transport me to that time. And Joy and Pain, which is, again, actually, I hadn't thought about it, quite relevant now. But uh, a lot of people don't know Maze. You know, I'll sort of talk about Maze and people go, who's that? But, you know, again, very iconic songs for me. Um, um, and they were all kind of milestones in my, my, my life, I suppose. You know, I started a business at 16 and a half. It's the same business I'm in now. So that's 43 years, it's the same business. And music has always played a massive part for me. And when my father died, when I was 16, I ran away to South Africa and ended up uh, being with a group called Pacific Express, who at the time were like the Beatles in South Africa. And they were an all black um, group and apartheid existed then. So what I was doing was totally illegal. And um, I ended up touring with them and, you know, tambourine and, and singing and all of that. And I was taking them music in the townships like the Crusaders and Dave Cruzen and um, War and um, um, uh, Han uh, what was his name? Um, Herbie Hancock and uh, Sam Getz and all these people they hadn't heard of, you know, and, th and they were all incredible musicians and some of them incredibly well known, like Jonathan Butler today, you know, who wrote for Whitney Houston. And I was dating him at the time and, and, and he came back to London with me and got a, you know, a, um, met with an A&R team and got a record deal. And, you know, so like music was so important at a time that I was quite lost when my father was, had died. So, um, yeah, so th that, and Maze was around sort of that time. So it's, it's quite relevant to me. So, so music has just been, you know, a, a really focal point um, of, of your whole life, it, it seems. And, 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 and at, at that time, that was, that was before you, you were designing, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think also music, uh, if you hear music, you know, if, if I think of someone like Sting, you know, I love his music. And there, there was a time when I was quite sad, um, you know, when I was sort of like, uh, 20, like 25, 26, uh, when I got divorced. And I remember listening to a lot of Sting, but it gave me, even though it was a sad time, I can still listen to that music and feel good about it. So I, you know, it doesn't relate to something, you know, music has always got a good feeling about it. But I think 
some people can hear a, um, a song and go, oh my God, do you remember or whatever? It really does transport me back into that time. It's quite strange. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it has, it has that kind of sentimental effect on, on so many people that I speak to. And um, I mean, again, this, the Soul to Soul track is, is probably around the same time, right? Was, was that late 80s or 90s? Yeah, and Jazzy is a dear friend of mine. And I, in fact, you should listen to my podcast that I had him on because it was really fascinating to sort of really talk to him about that whole era and what he did and everything. Because at the time, listening to that music, you know, back to life, it's like you hear that and it just goes, boom, you're there. But understanding how he created this extraordinary brand, if you like, you know, like he was a true entrepreneur where he changed the face of, of music and, and everything he was doing. I think last year, um, and it was just crazy to, you know, every song is just upbeat and you feel happy and it, it sort of resonates with your soul. And, and also if you're at a concert and you see people all together, the happiness that you see in a space when music is playing and you just think we should be pumping music out onto the streets just 24 seven at the moment, you know, just to get yeah. people's, you know, um, moves up hospitals yeah. should be playing music constantly actually i just thought of that i'm going to bring it up with the the great campaign let's just pump music out to the world yeah i think a lot of people could use that i mean so in a, in a normal year would you go to uh, quite a lot of gigs would you go to to i love live music i like small gigs i'm i'm not great going to um you know and i do i go to the o2 and, and wembley if it's somebody i mean i was about to see diana ross and that got cancelled in July. And, uh, you know, I mean, she's just extraordinary, you know, iconic. But yeah, I mean, I love seeing live music and I really miss that. I'm, I'm not someone that goes to the theatre a lot. I fidget too much, but music I love because it's about movement and sound. So yeah, I, I definitely will miss that. Was the Diana Ross due to, was that due to be this month? No, it was July. It oh, literally, yeah, it just passed, yeah. I saw her a couple of years ago in Vegas when she was doing residency there. It was unbelievably good. Yeah. Uh, it's such a shame this year to, to have the gigs all cancelled. And, and, and I feel very bad for artists in, in the sense that there's no kind of way of planning things. People have all this stuff yeah. in a diary. Like the, the gigs are restarting supposedly from March next year. And yeah. One just doesn't know. Just uh, awful. One, one hopes that a lot of great sounds and, and uh, new albums will come. They often say, don't they, out of, you know, um, difficult times, great music. Yeah, that's why I kind of think, like, what's going on? Like, I hope um, what one amazing thing to come out of it would be if somebody wrote an album like that. Like, more than ever, you know, now feels definitely like a time where yeah, yeah. art like that could definitely lift us all up. Um, and someone who sadly passed away recently is the, or relatively recently, um, is the artist um, who this this song. Um, well, your next choice, which is a reefer. reefer. Oh yeah. Oh, um, I know. I mean, just. Yeah. I mean, you know, where do you start? She was, you know, everything about that woman was extraordinary. You know, everything she stood for. Um, you know, her her. She's, she's just, she was the most unbelievable musician and songwriter, but what an incredible woman with it and what an extraordinary story. Um, and again, you know, I, you put that on and everyone is going to feel something or, or have a story they can tell that relates to when they first heard that. Um, yeah, I think there's a movie coming out, isn't there? Soon? Yeah, I, is, it, is it a biopic? There's already been a movie of, of her kind of performing in the 70s, which I still need to see. There's been a yeah, kind of... Yeah, I'm going to look that up, actually. But if it's a biopic, that would be amazing. And did, did yeah. you see that performance, uh, I think it was four years ago, where she was at, um, at Carol King's Kennedy Centre Honours. Yeah. A natural woman with the fur coat that she takes off in the middle and she's playing the piano at the start. It's so unbelievably good. Amazing. I mean, Carol King as well is somebody that I adore. So, yeah. 
yeah, she's yeah. an incredible songwriter. But, and uh, d during that performance of Natural Woman, you could see just how kind of flawed she was because I don't think she was expecting Aretha Franklin to to, to do that. To do that. Yeah, 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 amazing. And um, and well, so the next song you've chosen is "Say a Little Prayer" uh, Bert Bacharach. But um, you know, is is the version that you listen? To, you, do you listen to? the Burt Bacharach version or do you listen to the down? So here's version? the thing, my dad, right, um, loved Burt Bacharach. And uh, so, and we often used to play that. And so for me, that's kind of, it always, I always think of my father, but I was very fortunate to meet Burt Bacharach many years ago and meet his wife, Jane, who I'm still in touch with. And so I met him and went to some concerts. I mean, he was fairly old then. But I mean, again, he's one of those people that you don't, until you actually read up or go to a concert or listen to his music, you don't realize like he wrote everything. Like, you know, whether it's whatever it was, raindrops, what, you, know, the, you know, you know, those iconic ones that are attached to film, but so much and his incredible ability. Uh, the last time I think I saw, one of the last times he did a duet with um, uh, Will, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Um, oh, I can't think of his name now. A young guy who was on X Factor but didn't win. Will Young. Will Young. Yeah. I saw them on stage together doing an incre incredible duet. It was fantastic. And that was the first time I met him in, in reality. And I was just literally stood there, didn't know what to say. I mean, I was literally kind of like, oh my God, you're such an icon, but such an extraordinary guy. And, but again, that is very uh, specific to me because of my dad. But again, it's an, it's an amazing song that so many great artists have sung, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dionne uh, Warwick, I think, sang it, and yeah. Yeah, he wrote, I mean, pretty much most of Dionne Warwick's big hits. I yeah. Mean, Harry Gibb wrote a couple in the 80s, but, and, and then a lot of other things, you know, just random things that you wouldn't expect, like the Christopher Cross Arthur's theme for that yeah. film. Oh, yeah, 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 I forgot just about that. Just these things from left field that, that he that he wrote, um, yeah, Baccarat and David's sort of one of the one of the great songwriting teams of all time, for sure. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting, but both Diane Warwick and Aretha did say a little prayer, um, which she wrote. And both, they all sang it differently, but it will be, and that's another interesting thing, that, that one song could be sung by so many people but always sound good. You yeah. know, I think that's testament, isn't it, to, um, you know, and I don't think you can say that about many things. You know, I, I can design a room and then give that package to someone else to go and do it and it won't look as good. But if, you know, the fact that you can write a song and so many artists can sing it and it can still sound great, I think is a real testament. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a sign of a good song. Uh, there's, so, there's so much um, soul music on, on this list, um, which, I know. <laughs> which is, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it must be among my favorite uh, genres. And the, the next artist, Al Green, uh, just, I mean, it seems to be split your list between kind of 70s, like I, people who have become icons now, um, or almost were icons immediately, and then, and then kind of like 90s um, soul. I mean, the, the, labeling these artists, artists with just a, a decade is a bit unfair because it's all timeless music. But um, yeah. but yeah, tired of being alone. Um, how, how come you chose that track of all the Al Green classics? I think my, my brother uh, put, gave, you know, gave me Al Green. And um, again, just, uh, you know, my, my, I suppose a lot of the songs that I chose on the day that I sat down and was asked the question, they just sort of came to my mind. But, you know, Al Green was, was very much one of those things that my brother sort of put in front of me. Um, and I sort of, spoke earlier about Stan Getz, which is a totally different, you know, so there was, there's all kinds of different jazz, soul, funk that I love. Um, but Al Green, again, it's just, it's like, it's an iconic sound that just makes me feel good. And I think for me, I choose music that I love to listen to rather than struggling to listen to it. And funny, somebody yesterday at lunch said, oh, listen to this guy, he's brilliant. And I went, oh, I, I don't like it. And it doesn't mean to say he's no good. It just didn't resonate with me. But it's interesting to think that it did him. Everyone's got different, yeah. It's the, it's the clothes you choose, isn't it? 
Are, are, you quite, are you quite forthright when it comes to? Um, do you find it easy to say that you don't don't like something? Because I I find it quite yeah. difficult. <laughs> like if someone plays me, if it's if someone played you their stuff, would you would you find it difficult to say? Like say say you had a, a friend, and they they said, okay, I've just been to the studio and I've made this, I've made like an EP or something. And oh, they I think I would. Awful. No, I mean. I wouldn't want to hurt someone's feelings, but if I, I would know if it was, if, if it was a brilliant piece, but I would say it's just not my kind of music. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would yeah, say that. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be nasty to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, I, but I am very sensitive to sound. So, you know, in our home, we play, luckily for me, John and I love the same music. I, I could not imagine being with someone and you, <laughs> You know, someone was listening to sort of rock music and I was like into the music I was in. I think that would just be horrendous. That should, yeah. <laughs> so if someone was into like, you know, Metallica or Iron Maiden or something, would you find that a real... The deal breaker. <laughs> Total yeah, deal breaker. My dad's favourite artist is Van Morrison and my mum... Oh, Van I Van love Morrison. Van Morrison. I love Somebody Van Morrison. Somebody well. saw him recently and said he was amazing. Uh, again, my brother introduced me to Van Morrison. There's loads of Van Morrison I hey. love. One of the best of all time. I think he's finding the lockdown and, and well, he's gigging. He's, in yeah. the, he's, he's going to the, um, he's going to be in the Palladium this week. I'm, th I'm thinking of going. I mean, you know, in a way kind of good on him. I think he's getting quite a lot of flack for wanting to keep gigging, but I kind of think. Yeah, like, listen, go for it. Rules, um, and stuff, like, yeah. so why not? It's quite yeah. nice on live music. Um, so, so the next song is uh, A Long Walk by Jill Scott. Oh. I mean, really, <laughs> just like that intro into that is just, uh, again, I, I sort of found out about Jill Scott quite late in life, maybe 18 years ago or something. But you put, I put it back on recently and it was just like you stop, you just stop in time and just listen to that, that intro. And there's a great um, rendition of it with no words, just instrumental which is also lovely actually to, to listen to, but she's amazing. I don't know, she brought out a new album recently? Um, I think she's brought out something a couple of years ago. Uh, Let's check that out actually. But, but I mean, it's, it's difficult these days because we've all got access to everything. I know. Streaming and, and I think releases sometimes do get buried because in the old days, you know, all the big releases used to be in the papers and the magazines and stuff. And now we're all just inundated with content. And of course, there's now the sort of, with the pandemic, it's quite difficult um, Very hard. to avoid the temptation to become addicted to news, I find. Yeah. It? Which is, which never used to be the case. Um, yeah. I'll tell you what I find fascinating is Spotify. Like I'll use Spotify and I'll be playing stuff and then they make you a playlist and you're like, how brilliant is that? And they get it right. Oh, or they'll, they get it right when, when they do your kind of discover week. Yeah. Well, they've just started this thing where they put repeat. So that songs that you've played a lot, they'll put all onto one playlist. And I'm like, whoever you are, Mr. Spotify, you're just so honest. It's brilliant. Yeah. So I, think, I think it's um, Spotify for, for consumers is, you know, it's an unbeatable deal. 10, like 10 pounds a month and you get all the music that mm. you want you can listen to pretty much any song that's ever been recorded i mean yeah. I, I hope that they find a way for for artists I mean, it tends to be it tends to be rock stars who've already made quite a lot of money in the 70s and 80s um, from record sales who tend to complain about spotify but the artists sort of get 0.0000p uh, 0.004p per stream or something so even yeah. if you get a million streams, you know, you make four grand. Yeah. So it's quite a low, it's quite a bad, uh, a a bad, bad deal. With, with no live music, um, it's difficult. But then on the other hand, for consumers, and uh, it's just, it's incredible. Mm. You can get lost down these rabbit holes of, of different genres. And I mean, well, Jill Scott kind of leads um, in, 
quite naturally, like if you're on Spotify and you found your Scott, you'd probably find Erica Badu quick, quite quickly after. Yeah. She's an incredible artist. Did, did, you, did you see her show? I think she did a show like last year in London for the first time in ages. No, I missed it. But I, I found out about her probably about 16 years ago and just fell in love with her voice and sound. And yeah, I mean, I get very excited when I hear something for the first time and then I become slightly obsessed by it. But yeah, um, beautiful voice, love her tone, everything about it. It kind of transports me into something. As I say, like music just puts me in the best mood to do whatever I'm doing. I love music. You know, people always say, you'd give great dinner parties like what is the answer and I go well I can't cook for for the you know I can cook but I don't enjoy cooking if you've got good music good lighting good people and some good wine what if you put something you know like fish fingers and fries in front of them they're still gonna have a great night you know it's about the atmosphere and music creates the atmosphere if people go into a, a store and they've got music that people like, they're going to spend more money. Uh, if you think about elevator music, how awful is that? If you have better music in an elevator, you know, that um, airlines, you know, have nice music playing on an airplane. If people are anxious about flying for the first time. Um, and actually talking to you today, I really think music can play a much bigger part in this whole pandemic thing. And it should be, we should be literally blasting it out in our streets. <laughs> yeah, well, it would, yeah, it would definitely, it would definitely pick people's mood up. Uh, I'm hoping. I mean, certainly, certainly, the playlist that you've chosen would pick up most people's mood. But uh, you know, I guess it's a question of taste. And and so, you know, in, in terms of your your own career, taste plays a huge part in 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 what you do. You know, like it's almost professional having good taste, right? Like how, yeah, how, but it's all relative, you know, you might not think I've got good taste, but you know, it's all relative. I think I've got good taste, but... <laughs> a lot of people seem to agree, right? <laughs> Thank you. you. wouldn't have had the career that you've had, but Thank have, you. have you ever had situations where you've designed things and, and, and people have said, you know, I'm not so sure about this, or has that been... No, yeah. one thing I do know, and it's true and it happens to me, when you first install something, it takes people time. They will initially come in and go, oh my God, I love it. And then it takes them time to digest it. Um, But you know, you might have the odd thing that someone says, I really don't like it and you change it, but it's small little things. But the way we design, we, you know, the CGI's that we create are like photographs. So nothing, it's not like they're going to have a surprise. Uh, so maybe in the early days when you didn't have that and you were just showing people things and then you installed it, you probably had more things that people would might want to change. But today, nothing goes to chance. That's, that's what we're designing. They sign it off and it's done. Um, yeah. And also, I pride myself in the... I, I'm very good at getting into people's heads and understanding what they want. And it's kind of part of the process that I most enjoy is like, getting to that point where I go, I just so know what you want. And then I go and create it. And you've got to have that confidence to be able to have the freedom to go and create something. Um, If you're not sure what someone wants, you can't design because it's just impossible. Otherwise you're designing for yourself. And um, so, yeah, I find that process very easy. And do do people sometimes or or often come to you with no real idea of what they want and it's just a question of you meeting them and and just kind of well a lot of people don't think they know what they want but i'm very good at finding out what they want but they didn't know they wanted it that's part of the magic of what i do because i believe everyone knows they just don't know quite how to pull it together um you know uh, i play the piano by ear but i don't i can't read music because i'm very dyslexic but i would know by messing around on a piano what the sound is that I want I wouldn't know how to get it I'd have to find it what I do is go into people's heads and extract information and ask the right questions to be able to get what they want and then they go yeah yeah yeah, that's exactly what I want and I go but you said you didn't know what you wanted (laughs) how long have you been playing the piano for well I don't play very much anymore because I don't have a piano and I should get one but um i when I was at school, because I was so dyslexic um, and didn't know I was dyslexic, music was a, a great 
I used to uh, uh, compose things and my father used to come in from work every night and I would say, oh, I've got a new composition. And my poor, poor father would have to sit down and hear me play all this stuff from the age of about 10. So I should take it up more. I find it very calming and yeah. Yes. I'm not very good, by the way. <laughs> Well, I mean, playing playing an instrument by ear is a, a, a cool thing to do because reading music is quite a daunting oh, don't. thing. And I mean, it's, it's uh, well, it depends what type of music you're into. But really, it's more the sort of like classical side of things where reading is, is essential. And for soul, yeah. it's not as useful, although that there are some who argue that it's kind of essential for all music. Um, so the final track that you've chosen is by an artist who I, the only um, song that I hadn't heard um, was Nicole Buss. Uh, the song You by Nicole Buss. Have you heard, have you listened to it? I haven't listened to it yet. Okay, it's very cool. It's very similar to everything else. I actually found that through Spotify. So, oh, really? yeah, so that that is kind of uh, new-ish. But um, it's, I've been listening to it for quite a while and it's just, I love the way it sounds. It just makes me feel really good. Um, and um, I, I train every day, I'm really into fitness and I always have music playing and it was a track that just kept coming up over and over again and so it made me go and look to see who it was so then I started looking at other stuff but it's a, gr it's a great track, listen to it. She, and she's um, quite, not that new an artist though, she's pretty big, right? She's had quite a lot of success. Yeah, 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 but I've literally discovered her in the last, I don't know, four or five years, so. Ooh. Yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to it. it seem, yeah, seems like she's, yeah, quite an interesting artist by the, by the looks of things. She's done, done a few, made a few records already and yeah, had quite a lot of success. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And certainly judging by the rest of your list, it's going to be a good one. Well, <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much for taking the thank time. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And I've got one final question for you, which is during this time, it's, uh, it's quite difficult um, for, for many people um, to plan for the future and to, to stay motivated um, with regards to their, their careers and, and their futures. And, um, you know, if you had one piece of advice for, for young people starting out in, in creative um, professions, you know, trying to make their way, what would it be? Well, it's interesting. Throughout the whole lockdown, I was giving daily talks to people and um, I love doing it. And, you know, I got a lot of response from people and, and my thing is that, you know, it is a really weird, odd time that we're living in. But I think, you know, I'm so much older and younger people, I think, have a real resilience to change. You know, that they're very good at kind of go, having spoken to people who are, um, they, they're like, well, this is what it is. We have to find another way. And I think that the only thing I would say is that you can't hold on to something that was. And, you know, for many months, it was like, when are we going to get back to the old normal? Well, then we're never going to get back to that. You know, right now, this is the world that we live in. And there will be a new world that we're going to get into, which will be better once we get a grip of this virus. And I just think that we have to live in the now and be positive. And as we're talking about music, use music to get you into a place. And I, and I did a lot of this when, throughout the, the lockdown. Find a sound that makes you feel good. There are opportunities out there and young people have this amazing ability to be able to connect with people um, on the internet and social media. And, you know, during the lockdown, I kept saying to people, you've got the biggest audience in your life right now. You know, if you sit in a, a place of negativity and find it hard to come out of that, you won't succeed. So you've got to find a positive of something and you have to find where you can place your feet on the ground to be able to start from that point. And I think uh, I'm a great believer in mirror image. If you start your day with a small meditation or something of positivity to get yourself in that st state of mind and just every day try and achieve something and be bold and ask for help um, and write to people and you know show people what you're good at and I think if, we, if, if you think about the whole collective of the whole world being like that at one moment, the power of that is very strong. So the more that young people can be that way in a, in a difficult time like this, then I think there are opportunities. And I think young people have the ability to do it much more than someone of my age. 
um, because we've lived a longer life not necessarily having to do that. So that would be my message to people, that there is hope. You have to hold on to it, but you have to create it yourself. You can't rely on other people. And by being that positive person, you will attract other positivity and something good will come out of it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good piece of advice because the knock-on effects of the pandemic, um, there will be some opportunities to come out of it. And it's very important what you said about, you know, you've kind of almost got the, the biggest audience of your life now. There are so many, in creative industries especially, there are so many people just sat at home. There are so many people um, who could be receptive to whatever it is that you do if you find the right way of capturing that audience. So yes. Yeah, and, and don't be frightened of change. Find new ways. Always look inside from, from the out. You know, let's look at, I do it every day in my business. How are we going to, you know, there are diff today I had a conversation about something we're launching. Well, let's find a new way of doing it because we ain't going to be doing it the way we thought we were. And let's stop thinking that. Let's look at new ways. There must be young people out there that will give us advice to do it.